Well, welcome everybody. Um, thanks for coming back uh, for the second session of our um, information gathering session on industry advances in mass spectrometry and separations technology. Um, I'm Trisha Doholsky, um, one of the associate program officers um, on this project, and then Marcus Hafner, one of our consensus study committee members, will be moderating today. Um, but before that, we will go through just a few housekeeping items. Um, so just an overview of this committee activity. So this is a meeting that is an information gathering activity for the consensus study on sequencing, sequencing and mapping of RNA modifications. Um, the study and the meeting are sponsored by the Warren Albert Foundation and the National Institutes of Health. Um, and then shown here is our consensus study committee and they helped us to um, plan this information gathering session. Um, and you can also see our National Academy staff team here. And then um, just a few reminders, you can make comments and ask questions by using the chat or raising your hand in Zoom. If you have any technical questions or issues, you can contact Nam Vu um, and his email is shown here, but you can also private message him in Zoom. Um, the comments and ideas made during this meeting should be attributed to individual speakers and not their organizations unless otherwise stated. Thoughts shared during the meeting should not be interpreted as the opinion of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering or, and Medicine or the committee conducting the study. Uh, the meeting will be recorded for use by the committee and harassment and bullying will not be tolerated. So um, if everyone could just be respectful of all fellow participants and speakers, that would be great. Um, and then now I'm gonna pass it over to our moderator, Marcus Hafner. Hello everybody. Uh, so my name is Marcus Hafner. I'm an investigator at the National Institutes of Health and a member of this committee. Uh, that is tasked to develop uh, a roadmap for achieving the direct sequencing of RNA, so basically getting a comprehensive overview of everything that is an RNA, its structure, modifications, etc. And so we are, um, in the course of our information gathering, we'll be looking at all sorts of uh, aspects related uh, to developing uh, their final goal, and for the purpose of today, these are pretty much uh, gaining insights in the scientific needs and particularly the me methodologies and their limitations uh, as related to the sequencing of RNA. And of course, uh, we'll be excited to hear anything about potential new technologies. So um, our meeting goals um, are to understand the current capabilities and limitations of RNA separation and mass spectrometry and we hope to hear uh, um, something about ongoing or planned research and development activities by uh, our company speakers. Who, um, so we have three speakers today. So uh, Martin Gillar from Waters, Mike Greig from Bruker, and Ben Dunstead from Agilent Technologies. And uh, so uh, we hope that uh, the talks that we're hearing will be something like 15 minutes with five, uh, five to 10 minutes of discussion, uh, 10 minutes maximum. And with that, uh, I would uh, let's start and welcome Martin Gillar, who is a scientific fellow working at separations research and development at Waters. Welcome. I think you're sorry, I was muted. Um, yes, thank you very much for the inter introduction. Time is short. I will get right into it. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I'm going to mention a few separation methods, most importantly, iron pair reverse phase chromatography and some other potentials, and then talk about LCMS and some aspects of it that I see that we have solved successfully in the industry and some parts that are still um, at works. So let's move on. Uh, iron pair reverse phase chromatography, in my opinion, it's, it's the best method currently available for LC and MS of oligonucleotides. And when I say so, I mean the, the oligonucleotide-based drugs. So mostly those 20, 30, they're oligonucleotides. Here I show the example 21 mer, beautiful result from the failed sequences. Each of those failed sequences 
and small peaks can be assigned by mass spec mass. And we can sort of get, uh, deduce what the sequence is. If there are some peaks in between that we don't know what they are, we can use LC MSMS. And because this is sort of sample unlimited application in the nucleic acid drugs, we can load a little bit more and to get the sensitivity where we need it. So, so far, so good. Next slide, please. There are, of course, now much longer oligonucleotides that we deal with. sgRNA, uh, upper left corner, it's like typically 100 mers. So let's have a look at these anti-reverse phase method. They can deliver uh, the separation, baseline separation, let's say up to 60, 70 mers, and then it gets the selectivity diminishes. Still, it's, it's good. Um, but it's about as far as we can go. I am about to publish some paper with 150 mares poly A tail mRNA analysis. And yes, we can get some resolution there, but that's really, really about as far as I think we can go. The next slide. Um, if we are talking about longer pieces of RNA, including some mRNA, uh, size exclusion chromatography can do something very interesting here. Yes, it is not the high resolution technique. It doesn't give us N, N minus one separations, but it gives based on the pore size of those size exclusion columns. It is a beautiful method uh, that even has some potential for LCMS, but it's a method to resolve big pieces from short pieces and perhaps could be used as a, one of the sample prep techniques. Uh, next slide. So I already mentioned that when we deal with long oligonucleotides and long nucleic acids, the LC, no longer we have a resolution of N N minus ones, that's natural. Um, also the mass spec starts to lose its ability to analyze it with a decent sensitivity. I will later on show some examples why it is so difficult, but the solution to this, if we cannot do it in one piece um, of something that has a half million Daltons or one million Dalton, we then do the regular trick. We chop this large pieces of RNA into small and more manageable oligonucleotides. And now we can do this so-called mRNA mapping. It has been published in literature. It is used for sgRNA characterization, maybe dRNA characterization, and mostly for mRNA. The, what I show here on the upper right corner, the red mass spectrum, mass spectrum is the deconvoluted spectrum of the poly A tail. It, uh, we, we can do these uh, like 100, 127 mer longs. Um, you can see that there is a microheterogeneity. All of these peaks is one of the species and it, the delta mass in between those peaks is the mass of one mononucleotide A. So we can do those applications, but we cannot get the mass directly for the intact mRNA, especially if it, if it has the microheterogeneity. The next slide. You can appreciate that this digestion here I show you one example of helic, hydrophilic interaction chromatography. It's an alternative, it's LCMS compatible method. It is now being more widely used. It's a new thing, so everybody is excited. Um, it perhaps doesn't have a, as high resolution as iron pair reverse phase chromatography, but it has a orthogonal selectivity in a sense. If, and this is what I show here, if you just look at the shore oligonucleotides, this blue chromatogram 20 mer, you can chop it by RNA's T1 digest onto smaller pieces. You could use it as a characterization method. Um, here you can see that the separation order is four, nine, and seven mer. And that is weird. And that is because that nine mer doesn't contain phosphate group attached to the three prime. And hence it has a different overall hydrophilicity. So the helic is a method that is really sensitive to the hydrophilic or hydrophilic groups attached to the oligonucleotides and that alters the selectivity and it really is kind of neat separation. 
um, the next slide. Of course, I know that Marcus, uh, you mentioned that you are also interested in discovering the modification. So when I say we are in a decent shape with LC and LCMS or oligonucleotides, and that we can do MSMS sequencing. That is the confirmatory sequencing. We know the sequence up front, all is good. If we have completely unknown sequence, that is an order of magnitude more complex task, and you would need really a good software. If, however, you know the roughly the sequence and you're looking just modifications um, or modifications in that sequence, it's somewhat in complexity wise, it's somewhere in between. Nevertheless, it, it gets tough. And if you don't know where what is, uh, one of the method here shown is that we can take RNA, we can digest it to nucleotide or nucleosides, and then just look at those small molecules, uh, four main constituents of RNA, plus all of its potential methylated and other modifications. It's good, it works, it's published, but you lose the sequence information. You don't know where the modification happens. You also need as the labeled standards to do the quantitation. So some limitations, but this is definitely one of the good methods. Next slide. So the, when I talk about LCMS and MSMS, and now I start to talk about longer oligonucleotides, something 20 mers are easy to sequence completely. 40 mer, it's not easy and you may not a complete you may not get a complete sequence read through the sequence. If it's longer, then we are in trouble. Uh, there definitely this is a research subject. If you go well beyond those scales of lengths, uh, I show here the papers published recently the SGRNA work. Uh, what typically we observe for long uh, oligonucleotides is the adaptation. Sodium potassium adducts are very significant, much more significant than for shorter oligonucleotides. That's the left panel. Um, the sample has to be purified, otherwise you don't get a really useful spectrum. On the right side, it's not as striking, uh, but the adducts are everywhere. Every charge state has adducts and the longer nucleic acid it is, the more abundant adaptation and difficult to handle this it is. Also, now when it, you lose the sensitivity, the complexity is there, the, there are multiple charge states, as I show here, uh, there could be easily 40, 50 charge states. It splits the signal, you lose the sensitivity. And last, the software. We would need additional software to do interpretations of these long, uh, LC, MS, and MSMS analyses. So next slide. I know I'm going fast through this, but I want to get to the this point, for example. So one of the improvements that we did at Waters was that we recognize. Um, could you please click again? Uh, we recognize that, and customers have seen this. Nucleic acids are very negatively charged molecules. And it has been argued that there is some sample loss uh, when you inject first sample on a virgin column, that's the red chromatogram, you may lose the signal, it gets better upon injection number two, and then the signal improves. This is confusing, counterintuitive, and it has been argued that this is the non-specific adsorption to the sorbent of the uh, chromatographic sorbent on the column. Um, but now we recognize it's mostly the non-specific adsorption to the metal surfaces. That means the hardware, LC hardware, needle, electrospray needle, even in mass spec. Uh, Fritz are the biggest culprit. So we know, and we also know it gets much, much worse in, um, in acidic uh, mobile phases because now the metal oxide surfaces are now charged positively and then they eagerly absorb these nucleic acids. So it could be partially corrected uh, with column passivation, um, special mobile phases at high pH. But next slide, the solution that we came up with is 
we literally take our columns hardware and we modify it chemically so that all the metal surfaces, especially in the fritz uh, and the column body and even the LC system itself could be modified or is modified with the hybrid silica technology. So now there is a no possibility for sample interaction with metal oxide surfaces and the next slide. Uh, it has the effect that you see here. You saw the left panel already. There is some loss when we inject the sample, and that do that doesn't happen when we have these modified columns. Um, and again, this is the same column packed with the same sorbent, except the metal hardware has been chemically modified. So upon injection one, you have a full recovery of the sample. So that is definitely something, next slide, that will enable us now to do high sensitivity analysis. When I mention non-specific adsorption, if you have uh, hundreds of picomoles or nanomoles of the sample, this effect is negligible. Once you are going after tens of femtomoles, this non-specific adsorption effect is enormous and it needs to be dealt with. So, the last part and uh, just the last snippet of information, I mentioned that we need software for LC, MS and MS, MS interpretation. And even when we do the mRNA analysis, mRNA mapping, we need a software that basically predicts what the expected masses sh should be in a sample. There are tens, if not hundreds of peaks. Manual interpretation is increasingly difficult. So all the Manufacturers now have developed some kind of software. We have a software that's called uh, Intact Mass. And here I show example for just a simple synthetic oligonucleotides, 21 mer. If it's heavily modified in many of those mononucleotides, they have a certain modifications. There could be also oxidation, deamination, there could be uh, truncation and so on. So the interpretation, manual interpretation is quite tedious. Now with the software, it actually will assign all these LCMS peaks with the expected mass. And if there is a match, it will call it and it will tell you, yes, you are truncated. Yes, you are deaminated. Yes, you appear to be uh, the losing sulfur and it's oxidated form of phosphorothiolate and so on. In case, and there will be cases where simple MS will not be enough to make the call. We need to go to a next, next level and that's the confirm sequence software that will perform LC MSMS and based on fragmentation will make the interpretation of the sequence. And again, I am talking about confirmation sequence. It's not a de novo sequencing, it's a confirmatory sequencing. So the next, slide I think is my last one. Um, in summary, as an industry, we think we are in a decent shape with LC separation methods. Uh, even for long oligonucleotides now, um, we are developing, the MS is sensitive enough for many applications. The software is getting there, but the caveat here, we mostly focus on this nucleic acid-based therapeutics and not necessarily into uh, biological samples, extraction of small amounts of mRNAs from biological matrices and uh, these more complex applications that Marcus, you may have in mind. Um, so that's, that would be my conclusion of, of this talk. So thank you very much and we can open the discussion. Thanks a lot, Martin. So um, yeah, let's start the discussion. Uh, questions from the committee? Oh, Brenda, you uh, start. Um, thank you, Martin, that was great. And so uh, I, this is not my expertise, but I understood that when you were completely digesting uh, the, the, the oligonucleotide, you could get good quantitative data. 
I'm wondering about connotation in um, the, uh, when you are just looking at fragments or longer pieces. And I, my particular question would be something like, okay, if you have a tRNA and you think it's tRNA phi, but actually at some positions it's modified, not at all, and some it is modified a lot. I'm wondering from that sample, can you tell how much heterogene, heterogeneity you have in that sample? Mm -hmm. So the tRNAs obviously heavily modified. There could be various versions to micro heterogeneity. Um, we could do some size exclusion first, capture and isolate the tRNA range from all other different sizes. We can send it to a second dimension chromatography, LCMS, where you can get partial or actually quite a nice separation of all the micro heterogeneity. And the LCMS will give you additional separation dimension. So you will get mass. In the first simplest uh, application, you will get a mass. This is good enough to infer what modifications are on your tRNA if you know roughly the sequence that it is. If you don't know what the sequence, hence the mass it should be, you will end up with list of masses in relative uh, abundance. That's, that's about as much as you can get. If you really need to look into what the heck the sequence is and where the modifications occurred, then you probably would chop it into smaller pieces and do LCMS and mass on those pieces. And that, as I said, is an experiment that is not one afternoon that could take you a month if you are a very proficient with the method. Thank you. And so, so what you're saying, I think, is, is uh, what you would hope is you could deal with that heterogeneity in the separation method, uh, uh, if you could, because mass spec, it's going to be harder. Um, yeah, and nowadays, I would say it's about equal. Um, it, it is hard to get a good MS spectrum, uh, but we, we now have a good mass spectrometers and good methods. I think it is possible to get it. Thank you. More questions? So just a naive question then uh, from my side. So how complex can a mixture be for you to resolve on your on your columns uh, in the uh, in the ideal case? Um, so mRNA, um, as I said, you digest it. It has a four thousand nucleotides. When you digest it with certain enzymes, RNA T one is a good example you get your 150 peaks uh, or more. You will resolve partially or completely about 50 to maybe 100 of those. Uh, but there will be some coalitions. Um, you will have to go into MS level to really figure out what each of those peak is. And even MS will not give you a complete answer because, well, you have some scrambled six mares, there is a good chance there will be five of the isobaric oligonucleotides, just scrambled sequence, right? It exists in that mRNA. And you will not know simply by MS which one is which. And now, can you confirm based on those data the sequence if you don't know? So you will have to go to MS MS if you really want to know. The separation power is quite amazing, but never will you resolve everything that is there. And all of those peaks may hide something minor, some minor components that are real, and you may not know what they are. More questions? Well, if not, yeah, we're in time. Then uh, uh, thank you, uh, Martin. And then let's move on. 
Um, the next speaker will be Mike Grieg, who is um, the executive director of Pharma and Biopharma at Booker. Hey everybody, let me uh, get my slides to share. Is this uh, in full screen mode now? It is now. Okay. So thanks everybody for inviting me. Um, whoops, what happened there? Uh, hang on a second. For some reason, the, oh, hold on. I gotta make one change here. The, high, the slides were hidden from a previous. Well, Sorry, technical difficulty here. Okay, let's try this again. <clears throat> All right, there we go. Um, just a bit on my background. Uh, I basically started my career doing oligos and RNA uh, many years ago. So it's pretty exciting to see that they are uh, coming back into play. Uh, my first job was at Isis Pharmaceuticals, which is now Ionis. Uh, and um, <clears throat> Basically, all my early research was oligos and RNA. I joined Bruker five years ago, and uh, we've started uh, a lot more focus on this. Um, so I'm not showing a lot of data. I can show you all app notes if you want, or we can discuss them more. I just wanted to, to kind of briefly go over what we have and leave room for discussion. Um, I think intact mass overall is... Uh, you know, we're in pretty good shape for intact mass up to 120 MERS. And uh, same, you know, for software and other things interpreting that. Uh, at Bruker, we also have MALDI. Uh, and, um, and when I talk about intact mass, I'm talking about with isotopic resolution. That means we can get the PPM mass accuracy level, which a lot of people demand. So with ESI, we've done 120 MER plus uh, with this type of resolution. And um, so that's, serving most of the needs, uh, you know, even tRNA, some poly A tails, guide RNA, things like that. So I, I think uh, overall the technology is in pretty good shape there. Uh, MALDI TOF, we have a lot of customers using MALDI when they're just looking at um, oligos. Uh, MALDI can be uh, quite good, uh, even with isotopic resolution up to 30 MERS. And so for people you know, producing a lot of oligos, different things, um, they can use MALDI and it's very high throughput. Um, and so, in currently uh, software platforms, whether it's ours or any of the other vendors, I think uh, for um, intact mass, I think overall, most of our customers say we're in pretty good shape there. Uh, where we need to improve uh, is the sequencing. So right now, what we do uh, for sequencing, uh, for electrospray, it's all CID. Uh, MALDI can also be used for sequencing using ISD uh, combined with CS CID. Uh, MALDI sequencing, uh, what, what we have found first with electrospray using CID is we can generally sequence almost anything. We've sequenced up to 70 and 100 MERS uh, intact, full sequence of CID. Um, as long as you have good enough uh, fidelity in the data and uh, software, you can, you can pick that out. And this is even modified uh, oligos up to about 100 MERS. Uh, with MALDI ISD, it's really more kind of a, for confirmation. The way ISD works, it's not uh, predictable. And so we don't know when we're going to get, you know, 20% coverage versus 80% coverage. Um, so as I said, some people use that just as a quick verification. Okay, we have part of the sequence, we have the right mass, that might be okay. Um, but this is something that can be developed in the future. <clears throat> uh, our software is called Biopharma Compass. OligoQuest is the portion for the DNA and RNA and oligo uh, sequencing, and that's still evolving. Um, clearly, uh, improved top-down sequencing software is needed as the data, especially for as you get bigger and bigger, gets very, very complex. 
Now, one thing I don't have on here, existing college, existing technologies is any of the uh, upfront platforms and chromatography. We leave that to our friends at Waters and Agilent because uh, they're experts at it and that's not exactly our specialty. So um, I don't discuss that much here. Um, as far as developing technologies, we are looking at things on the front end. Uh, as I said, I started my career working with oligos and in our lab, uh, Nobody was allowed to have French fries for lunch because oligos and RNA and DNA will suck sodium and potassium out of the atmosphere. And uh, as uh, some of the, uh, the slides from Martin showed. So we really need good ways to efficiently desalt uh, these uh, samples. Uh, and then also to di digest them. So we're working with a company called Integrated Protein Technologies. They make a device called the Sample Screen. It's membrane-based microfluidics. And we found that works really well uh, to desalt. And we've also done an mRNA digest on this. This is something we just presented at uh, uh, ASMS this year. Uh, basically, the idea is, is you can take an impact mRNA. Uh, the way this device works is you have uh, a membrane. So we took a 10K membrane. We just took an RNA so that was big enough to stay on top of the membrane. And the nice thing is, is once you start the digestion, once you get about a 20 mer, it actually comes through the membrane and then we can sequence those to do the uh, mass mapping quite easily. So this is the type of technology in the front end that we are developing. Um, we also just bought a company called Phasmatech. They have something called an Omnitrap. This will help us more for sequencing and enables uh, MS to end uh, all the electron type uh, association techniques and UVPD. And even though we find that CID, we can generally sequence almost everything with the proper software. We have found specific regions in mRNAs, which I probably are some type of structured region where we're gonna have to do some collisionally activated unfolding or something else before we can get the full sequence out. So we know we do need to expand on uh, the different types of techniques for MSMS. Um, <clears throat> we have uh, trapped ion mobility on our instruments. Uh, it works great uh, for uh, you know, anything from small molecules to peptide levels. And so uh, we think we can use this to really uh, improve the separation and analysis of nucleotides, especially heavily modified nucleotides or uh, with stereo centers. Um, and we also have quite good AI prediction of CCS values for lipids, uh, for peptides, and we believe we can do this for nucleotides too, as there's already small molecule prediction. So we think collisional cross-section is something that can, uh, at the nucleotide level can be really uh, important in the future uh, to be confident in how you're identifying these things. Another thing that uh, at Bruker we do is we do a lot of moldy imaging of tissues. Uh, we get asked about uh, imaging of oligos or RNA and the level in tissues is too low to do, but now we're working with a company that makes uh, probes, uh, basically antibody probes uh, to uh, attach to oligos. And that's something that we're developing now to see if we can look at distribution in tissues of oligos. Um, uh, this technique works great uh, for eyes um, and uh, a lot of other tissues. Uh, and so it might be a good way to identify not only uh, how your oligo drugs distributing, but uh, potentially for larger type uh, molecules. Um, sensitivity for PKPD where it was uh, mentioned by Martin, um, you know, we need better ways to get higher sensitivity to actually look at PKPD. We can look at a lot of these uh, molecules uh, when they're prepared uh, and purified, but to actually look at them out of uh, plasma and tissue samples, we're really gonna need a boost in sensitivity and also the front end sample prep. How do we get those things ready to go? Um, and so that is something that we have some instrumentation we, we think will work well. It's just something to develop more. Um, what's really needed, uh, in my opinion, is improved enzymes for RNA sequencing. Uh, right now, the, the choices are a little bit limited. Um, we think potentially using this membrane uh, type uh, approach will help us because then it doesn't really matter what the membrane is or the uh, enzyme is. And so that might solve some of the problems. 
Um, the role of ion mobility, especially as you get to larger and larger oligos or uh, structured RNA, how much can this help us? Uh, and uh, what can we do as far as predicting potential collisional cross section? And then of course, uh, uh, CDMS, uh, charge detection mass spec, uh, it's, it's available now, but it's not quite to the accuracy needed to be to look at intact mRNAs, especially if they're inside a uh, lipid nanoparticle. And uh, that's really all I had here. I had a couple other slides if uh, we wanted to look at pictures, but I thought this should be more about the discussion or other questions. Thank you so much, uh, Mike. Susan? So, Mike, I thought that was great, um, um, but I had some questions because mass spec isn't my area, although I, I've used mass spec with, with great respect. When you were talking about high fidelity data, because you said the software wasn't, was okay ex as long as you had high fidelity data, and I wasn't sure what high fidelity meant. Does that mean a, a large amount of sample or lack of heterogeneity or what does that mean? Uh, a good question. So let me get my laser pointer so you can have it on here. I included this slide because it should be able. So what I mean by high fidelity data is that the actual quality signal to noise and shape of the signal is, is very good. And so, whoops, sorry, this is, uh, I think this is an, uh, animated for, Anyway, if you look at the, the red is the uh, predicted isotopic envelope and the blue is what we measured. So high fidelity data in our term means that you, what you predict it should be matches very well with the measured amount. And when it matches well, you can get a very, very accurate mass in parts per million. A TOS are really, really good at this. Uh, trapping mass spectrometers are not good at it. And so if you don't have this fidelity of your isotopic envelope, say one of these peaks here, or one of these peaks here uh, is not where it should be, you cannot predict the mass. And um, so you really need good ion statistics and good use of uh, all your ions to do that. So that's, um, hopefully that was clear enough for a non mass spec person. Thank you. You're welcome. Did that make sense? Okay. Brenda? Uh, yes, thank you for that nice talk. Uh, I'm I'm interested in your comment about uh, sometimes there's problems with uh, messenger RNAs, and you were speculating that maybe there were structured regions, if I understood stood correctly. And I'm trying to um, uh, think about that uh, that in comparison to tRNAs, which have a huge amount of structure, yeah. which. Um, and maybe you're talking about, okay, tRNAs, you chop them up so much, and so the structure is not a problem, but I wonder if you would um, put that in context for me. Yeah, I would love to do that more, but we're just not quite sure, to be honest. So we've actually sequenced um, tRNA top down um, almost completely. Uh, we've done this with Dan Fabrice. He's actually the one who wrote the original uh, <clears throat> algorithm for our software. So we partner with him a lot. Um, and so tRNA doesn't really seem to be a problem. Uh, with the mRNA we looked at, it was about uh, 1300 nucleotides. And um, when we did this using uh, different enzymes and also our uh, membrane method, uh, we missed the same region in, in every way we've done this. And we're not sure if it's, we, it's hard to tell if it's a structure issue, if, um, Generally, we don't have an issue with modified uh, nucleotides, um, and, but maybe there's a certain sequence of them. Um, and we do know in biology that uh, sometimes that uh, when we can't sequence by CID, biology also can't deal with it. Um, and so uh, it's, it's, we don't know yet. Yeah, thanks, that, that makes sense. Um, and yeah. so when you talk about RNA enzymes here, are you talking about nucleases? Yes. Okay, thank you. Sorry if there's... Ah, another question, Susan? I had another question, if I may, and, and this just reflects a defect in my note-taking. You said the software was 
was good enough in one situation, but then you said you needed better software for another situation. Just reiterate what that different situation was, please. Yeah, so basically when people are looking at intact mass and want to look at purity. So basically, if you look at, like say this one here, this is the LC chromatogram and this is the UV signal, but the mass spec total ion chromatogram would look the same. And so, you know, Waters, Agilent, others have done a really great job uh, with chromatography and getting better. And so the software is pretty good at taking those of say, you know, shorter um, piece, shorter oligos or pieces of RNA get good separation and we can quantify quite well uh, what these various intact deficiencies can be. When it comes to MS-MS and doing sequence uh, confirmation and analysis or uh, especially de novo sequencing, the software is not fully automated. So you can't take a chunk of RNA, throw it into a system and have the whole process from front end to back end automated where you start with sample prep to full sequence uh, coverage in an automated fashion. At least not that I'm aware of. Okay, I get it. Yeah, that's good, thanks. Okay. Thanks again, Mike. That was really good, informative, great. Um, so the last uh, speaker of the session is uh, Dr. Ben Lundstedt from, uh, who is a senior scientist at Agilent. And um, yeah, welcome. Let's see where we'll get his slides up. Yeah, I'm working on it. <laughs> ah, there you are. Yeah. We're getting there. Okay, are you seeing the uh, no, you're normal mode? The swab. Okay. Is this correct? That's correct. Okay. Okay, so thank you very much for um, inviting me to do the meeting. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak. Um, and I think it's clear from the context of this meeting that, you know, LCMS can play a critical role in the characterization of nucleic acid, both as natural components in biological systems, as well as synthetic products for the use in emerging technologies. However, the ability to effectively couple high-performance liquid chromatography separations with high-resolution electrospray ionization-based mass spec has really only existed since 1997 with the introduction of HFIP um, TEA ion pairing approach. In this short talk, I want to present a retrospective review of the development of the techniques for characterizing oligos from Agilent's perspective as both a provider of synthetic DNA and RNA and as a manufacturer of the systems used to do the analysis. I will also discuss optimization, improvements, and emerging trends and opportunities for the future. I spent a lot of time on the synthetic side of this, so I'm very happy to talk to researchers looking at native oligos and learn what they're looking for. So here's the outline. I'll go you know, a brief history, then factors that affect LC separations and MS signals. And finally talk about, um, you know, similar to what the other uh, speakers talked about, our tools for impurity analysis and sequence conf confirmation. So a brief history to start, uh, in the mid nineties, HPLC separation of olig oligonucleotides was a well-established technique. With some variation, the dominant approach was based on the use of triethylammonium acetate as a nu at neutral pH as an ion pairing reagent in reverse phase chromatography. However, it was quickly found that coupling the separation with electrospray ionization was not trivial. Sufficiently high concentrations of TEA to maintain retention and resolution led to high levels of signal suppression in the SMS mass spec. Reducing the concentration of TEAA the levels where ESI could generate useful signal resulted in low retention and poor resolution as shown in this figure. So you can see uh, as TEA decreases, you start to lose that retention, but that's where you start to get uh, a signal and mass spec. 
1997, we developed and published the HFIP TEA ion pairing method that overcame this problem. The proposed mechanism of this method is that ion pairs and pH are maintained during the separation, resulting in good retention and resolution. However, during the desolvation of the ESI droplets, the volatile HF HFIP is removed, and at least at the surface of the droplet, pH rises. The oligos are ionized, and equilibrium favors the free charge oligo, which can then undergo ion desorption into the gas phase. Since that time, HFIP TEA method has been widely adopted, and a number of studies have examined the mechanism as well as optimization of various parameters. The separation of itself is relatively complex and involves a number of variables, some of which are listed here. Uh, you know, and they're all subject to optimization. However, when you couple the requirements of the separation with often competing requirements of the mass spec, it is a difficult problem. Furthermore, different problems often require different specific conditions, so there isn't one you know, best condition. It is important to optimize the speed and resolution of separation to balance that with the sensitivity and spectral information for the mass spec produced. As a secondary but important factor, LCMS grade high purity HFIP is expensive and there is a desire to reduce consumption of this product. Several studies have evaluated alternative fluoro alcohols, uh, some of which are shown here. To date, none have shown broad improvement over HFIP. Uh, furthermore, having emerged as a standard reagent for this application, HFIP is commercially available at high purity and remains a go-to reagent. However, the choice of alkylamine ion pairing reagent is a different matter. Longer, more hydrophobic alkylamines result in greater retention and separation in some cases. Depending on the target oligo under study, this can be exploited. Beyond their ability to affect selectivity, most alkylamines shown here behave similarly, although adjustment of gradient conditions uh, are required. In general, triethylamine, tripropylamine, hexylamine, and octylamine are the most widely used. The pH of the separation also plays a key role. While the original publication used neutral pH, it has since been shown that a basic pH uh, between 8.5 and roughly 9.5 results in a good balance between signal retention and column lifetime. Data here show the best signal for this 130 former um, is at 8.85 with dramatic fall off on either side. In terms of spectral characteristics, one of the challenges uh, that previous speakers have uh, alluded to is, um, and especially for longer oligos, uh, results from attic formation, particularly from sodium and potassium. This effect gets worse as oligo length increase, and these attics can compete, can complicate the spectral, the spectra and hide impurities. We have found that desalting as well as low levels of EDTA can significantly reduce the attic formation. Um, and clean up both the raw and deconvoluted spectra. And so here's an example of this. You can see a lot of the sodium addicts here that have been um, greatly reduced. And again, this gets more difficult the longer it is. Um, of course, the column characteristics play a key role in separation and LCMS compatibility. There are a number of suitable columns on the market that meet the requirements um, for the application, including Agilent's advanced bio oligonucleotide column. This 2.7 micron, 120 angstrom poor C18 is optimized for oligos and stable between pH 3 and 11. Uh, and it's good for thousands of injections. I've shown data here for a range of temperatures, but technically the operating limit is 65 degrees. The column also is available in wider uh, diameters for prep and semi-prep applications. Uh, I briefly want to turn away from HFIP TEA ion pairing method. Um, and I'm sure that some of you are aware of growing concern over PFAs. These polyfluoral alkyl substances are becoming a significant environmental problem uh, because they're widely used in a bunch of products. So we're a little concerned, uh, especially in the EU, that uh, the European Chemical Agency is taking steps to eliminate PFA, PFAs. And the implication of this is that we may no longer be able to use them um, in the future for oligonucleotide separation. So one approach to eliminate this that uh, was spoken about earlier is hydrophilic interaction chromatography. 
a helix separation uses acetonitrile as a weak mobile phase, and an aqueous buffer is a strong mobile phase. Recent improvements in stationary phase chemistry, such as Agilent's helix Z column, are making this a potential emerging solution. And so in here, shown here are some separations that can be achieved using this technique, which is compatible with electrospray mass spec. And so these are just some small 40 mer DNA and 20 mer RNA. It's not at the level and not as good as the ion paired uh, method that have been talked about previously, but uh, it may become necessary. Finally, I want to highlight a couple of common workflows that are supported uh, by the um, by Agilent, and in particular, our informatics solution, BioConfirm 12. The first is target plus impurities, which is used to identify and quantitate impurities of given, given oligo. So the workflow is shown here. Uh, you start up by, you know, set up your LCMS run, uh, which you use chromatography to separate the target and any impurities uh, as, as best as you can. And this has been fully covered by previous talk, um, how important it and useful it is to separate that out. Uh, the next step is to enter the nucleotide sequence. Uh, the system will generate a database based on target impurities, both uh, stuff that we know about and um, you know things that, that uh, the customer can put in as well. Um, then it uses a feature finding technique to find the actual oligonucleotide compounds in the data. And finally, it compares these features, uh, features to calculated masses or isotopic signatures of the target impurities. And this is an example of the isotopic signature, but it was um, well described previously. Uh, this slide shows some impurities that can be identified using the software. This particular data is interesting because uh, we're looking at a synthetic 150 mer RNA that has paste modified bases that are shown here. Uh, these modifications are known to undergo an undergo an in-source artifactual decarboxylation. However, by modifying source conditions, we, can, we have substantially reduced the decarboxylation signal, allowing depurination and depurination to be identified. So that's here, you can see this uh, minus 44 for the three uh, paste modifications that were in there. Um, that was eliminated by adjusting the, the source conditions. Um, and now the software can identify uh, different things, some of which I've highlighted here, you know, N minus one, N plus one, and some depurination, depurination signals. Uh, you can see the salt addicts, uh, and this is an example, you, you have 150 mer, it's very hard to get rid of those. Um, a second workflow, um, you know, that all of us are working on is, uh, Bioconfirm, in BioConfirm 12 is uh, called sequence verification. This is currently as close as we get to sequencing oligonucleotides, but um, it does require an oligo sequence so the software knows what it's looking for because as has been described, the data is very complex. So the workflow here is you start up by setting uh, LCMS run, which will generate ion fragments using MSMS uh, for that target sequence. Um, you also need to enter the nucleotide sequence, and the system will automatically generate a theoretical list of fragments, isotope patterns to look for. And here is uh, the fragments, uh, the McCluckey fragments that are, you know, generated by uh, this fragmentation process, as well as we do see some base fragments that are cutting off. So it'll generate this huge list, um, and then this will be seen in the sequence ladder uh, which I'll talk about later. But the final step is to compare all these theoretical fragments um, and the software will look for the acquired MS, MS spectra and annotate which fragments are matched. This slide shows uh, the sequencing workflow window. Sequences can be input with any modification by adding the chemical formula both to the nucleoside and the nucleobase. So yeah, here's what that screen looks like. Uh, the workflow setup is here where you enter all the uh, mass spec uh, conditions, et cetera. Um, and then you get uh, your TS, your tick, uh, which shows how the separation worked. Um, and then MS, MS spectra, which can be quite complex, but the colors are indicate which uh, fragments that it found. Um, over here is the fragment confirmation ladder, which I'll talk about in a minute. And finally, uh, 
the target oligonucleotide fragment ions that were identified. And these are scored based on how well it fit the predicted data. Um, okay, and so here is a fragment confirmation ladder um, of a 40 mer that we sequenced. And the dots indicate uh, the fragment type, so at which point it cut. And um, yeah, and so then it looks at the entire uh, sequence and determines, you know, which fragments verify the sequence correctly. And uh, this data or this uh, slide is to show that you can combine uh, multiple files to get a good overlay. Um, and the different colors indicate, you know, which uh, fragments and what the final sequence is. So in this case, we got most of the sequence covered. Uh, but uh, we're missing a couple spots. So we did uh, a different one, at, for example, on a different charge state of the initial oligo to get uh, complete sequence coverage. Okay, so in conclusion, and I don't need to reiterate, it's a short talk. So, um, you know, it, it basically went through the history, uh, where we are today. Um, and I think the improvements needed uh, have been talked about in the past. So it's just expanding the software um, to be able to do de novo sequencing. Um, and again, this is going to look a lot easier for smaller oligos, but uh, it gets more and more difficult as they um, increase in length and complexity. So with that, I'll end, and I'd be happy to take questions um, about any of this stuff. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, questions from the committee? So, how are you? I, I didn't. Uh, I, I mean, in the end, you presented how your how your software is dealing uh, with the LCMS uh, MS data. So, are you uh, integrating uh, uh, modifications uh, into that uh, workflow uh, identification of the of these uh, this stuff? Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, we have a lot of the basic modifications in there, but you can. Uh absolutely uh, add whatever modifications you want. And the way this is done is that you put in the chemical formula of the modification you're interested in, uh, and you put in the chemical formula for the nucleotide as well as the nucleobase. So if you get, um, if you get a fragment that cuts here, and you can also get a fragment that cuts at the base. So you can, you can uh, you can find modifications that occur both at the sugar and at the base potentially, although it probably requires a lot more experimentation to to weed those out. But yeah, absolutely, any modification um, is possible with the software. And again, this is stuff that has been done uh, in the past, uh, but this makes it a lot easier because it it does a lot of that work for you now that you used to have to generate the stuff uh, on your own. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Did you call on me, Marcus? I didn't. I didn't hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you, Ben. And I, I, I particularly uh, enjoyed hearing some of the history of the solvents that um, I didn't quite know about that. And um, I, my question um, is is actually um, directed to to all the speakers and. As you know, uh, our committee is really interested in, in pushing or, or what is the chance to push this technology forward for particularly for RNA uh, based technology and and I'm wondering um, how each of the speakers would describe the um, motivations or the drivers. Um, for their companies to be invested in and develop new technologies for RNA mass spec. And um, yeah, I, that's, that's, uh, I would appreciate any comments on that. Yeah, it's a good question. I guess I can start, uh, you know, from my perspective, uh, it, it's going to be market driven. Um, and the way that normally looks um, for something like the software is that yeah, people will re 
request certain things like uh, the sequencing technology. And the more, and the more that that happens, uh, the more that we, you know, track that information and, you know, through our salespeople or, or general inquiries. Um, and so, you know, for a long time, mass spec was very uh, peptide focused and, you know, the market's changed more. So, you know, with the uh, therapeutic oligos coming online. So um, that's the direction that this is driven. So uh, that's one good way to do it. Another way is to, you know, form collaborations um, in, you know, fields that we think that uh, there could be a market or interest. You know, we always want to be pushing the envelope. Um, but yeah, it's, we also are interested in, in what the customers want. So when you say collaborations, Ben, what, what do you mean? Partnerships with uh, academics or what, what exactly do you mean by that? Yeah, we do that. So we'd like to uh, partner with um, you know, leaders in the field uh, to push that. And so uh, it makes it a lot easier because then we don't have to do uh, some of the development work on the side. So developing new technologies, uh, it, it's a great way to do that. Thanks. Any of the other speakers have comments on that? I think it's, um, this is Martin Gillar. Uh, similar, it's market, market driven. So we now see the big upswing because of mRNA, because of the uh, fast uh, development of siRNA technology. So we all are getting these requests from customers and uh, Therefore, it makes sense to pay more attention to it. Um, I also have a history with uh, nucleic acid analysis and so on. So part of my drive is scientific interest. Um, and if you said that Comet is interested to push the technology and maybe repurpose of what is available there into your field, uh, that's maybe something that we don't see that often, uh, but if you actively approach the companies, um, uh, and now you have the key contacts, uh, we would definitely consider some uh, like discussions, collaborations, um, we co-publish papers and so on and so on. Thanks. I guess there's one more person if they want to weigh in. Yeah, not a whole lot to add. I mean, it's all market demand driven. Um, you know, as I said, my background's all goes in RNA, and so I'm excited to see it going. Uh, but it's uh, it, it's pretty obvious when you look at the market what's going on. There's people are talking about RNA, siRNA, uh, RNA seq, uh, things like that, just all the time. Um, Good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's 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 uh, and and it's really kind of coming down to um, transcriptomics. Uh, all the way down through proteomics and every other type of omics data is starting to be in high demand to, to build a multi-platform analysis for drug discovery. Thanks. Rusha? Yeah, I, this is for all the speakers as well. I was kind of wondering, um, it's more of a workflow question. So I know, um, you know, a lot of comparisons have been made to proteomics, and I'm kind of curious at this moment where the field stands for taking, you know, doing the same sort of workflow that proteomics people do, you know, digesting a mixture of proteins into smaller peptide pieces, separating those, and then analyzing them, and then comparing the MSMS to a database of known um, protein sequences. I'm wondering, like, is there a common workflow that exists currently for RNA, or is that just not there yet? Is the separation combined with the MSMS, combined with you know the limitations in software? Is there, do you see it going in that direction, or is that sort of still a limitation? Because I'm seeing that most a lot of what I'm seeing here is very targeted, um, known RNA sequences or molecules, but I'm wondering what the discovery based method like outlook looks like compared to what proteomics is doing currently. Yeah, I guess from uh, my point of view, um, the technology for oligos and uh, 
RNA hasn't really developed much in, since I started it uh, until recently. Um, and so I think workflow wise, we're kind of where proteomics was 15 years ago. Um, it's in, you know, it's a little bit segmented. Uh, people still look at the, uh, you know, the MSMS data to make sure it looks good or people in proteomics never do that anymore. Um, and so I think uh, it's, it's moving that way, but it's quite a ways behind as far as complete workflow that can be industrialized in that pharma lab. Perspective is uh, that there are similarities between proteomics and uh, let's say genomics, um, including some of the mapping like peptide mapping or RNA mapping. One caveat, all nucleic acid work is two reorders of magnitude less sensitive in mass spec. That's a big problem. Second, we can make up for it by some PCR methods. We can amplify certain uh, pieces of DNA, RNA, and to maybe use that. Uh, but obviously it doesn't really solve the problem if we are now looking for some modifications. You, that amplification would basically eliminate that information. So it is, there are some similarities, but no, the genomic is gonna be slightly different. Different story. Yep, and I agree with both uh, Martin and Michael on that. It, it is behind, it has been for a long time, um, unfortunately, because I love oligos as well. But uh, yeah, I think it'll follow a, a similar pattern um, or similar methodology, but it just needs to be developed. So, if there are no more questions, uh, I would like to thank all the speakers again. This